Okay. Today's topic is something that's near and dear to my heart. We're talking about motherhood. And I really hope that men and women will listen to this episode. Um, many of you, I hope you guys know, I hope you guys know I have four kids. Um, and man, motherhood has been such a journey for me because I started out as a stay at home mom for a decade. And now I am running my own business and have four kids and I'm not married anymore. So I'm, you know, I've had like a wide variety of motherhood experiences, I guess I'd say from divorce and single mom life to from, you know, married stay at home mom, like all of it. And I've learned a ton. And so I just get really real with our guest today, who's Liz Carlisle. We actually met at a biohacking conference in Orlando and, um, somebody introduced me to her and was like, you guys have to get on a podcast episode together. So let me tell you a little about Liz. Um, she is actually the host of one of the top parenting podcasts. It's called motherhood unstressed. She's a TEDx speaker and she is just sharing messages to help empower women all over the world to know that you can be a mom and you can be happy and you don't have to be stressed out all the time and just feel like you don't have your own stuff going. Like motherhood should also be happy, you know, like, and I love that she's bringing that um, to us. So check out her podcast. It's called motherhood unstressed. Um, and she also has a CBD line that she shares about here, which is awesome. Def definitely goes hand in hand. Um, and you can find out about that on her website, motherhoodunstressed.com. So let's go ahead and jump in all about motherhood with Liz Carlisle. Okay. So Liz, we were talking right before we started, we're both moms, we're both business owners, entrepreneurs. Um, and I was, you know, talking to you a little bit about how I feel like my audience is. So guys, I'm just totally kind of guessing on you guys, but I feel like a lot of my listeners, at least from my feedback on social media and my client base we have a lot of high performers, a lot of people who like want to see what they're capable of there. There's kind of been this awakening, right. Of like, maybe there's more for me than just going through the motions in life. And when you start pushing into that energy, I feel like the, the first place people go to is like drive as hard as I freaking can. Like first you want to get past the fear. Usually there's fear and who am I to live the life of my dreams? I can't do that. And then it goes into this, like, um, pressure. And even if you're not in that place, like, I feel like moms specifically, it's like, um, you're a good mom, you're a good woman, you're a good wife. If you drive yourself into the ground and do everything for everybody and are easily accessible for whatever anybody needs in any given moment, now you're a good mom. Now you're a good wife. Now you're a good woman, you know, and I would love for you to start off. You know, we talked about your Ted talk is called mom. Self-care isn't selfish. And that resonates with me so much. I tell my clients a lot, like be selfish because their perception of just basic self-care is that they're being selfish. Like I want to go to the gym, but I feel bad leaving my kids at home with my husband. Like yeah. truly it's common, you know? So um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, let's start off the gate with that self-care and being selfish. What have you seen amongst women, you know, and yourself possibly too, that have led you to creating this motherhood and stress podcast and starting to share these messages? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you hit it right on the head. I mean, there is this, this sense of overwhelming guilt and uh, in you're shooting yourself to death if you yeah. dare, you know, step out and start taking care of yourself. And so yeah. For me, you know, I was always, you know, a very athletic kid. Um, I always had sports and running. That was like kind of my therapy growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I became pregnant and had my first son and was kind of thrown into, oh God, the tumultuous waters of new motherhood where you don't know what you're doing and it's scary. Like it actually is, nobody talks about how scary motherhood is. It was almost like I was forced to really reassess, you know, who am I? What am I doing? Um, you know, what's, what's really important. And of course, your attention is on your children is on, you know, relationships, the house, your job, you know, you still have all those things. But I had gotten to a point and I talk about this in the TED talk where I was so unhappy, and scared and anxiety ridden. And I really just I mean, it kind of came to a head one night when I was bathing my son, and he was like six, seven weeks. And I just started to cry. And it was like this moment of clarity, which of course I'm on the bathroom floor. How many people have had moments of clarity on the bathroom floor in their homes? And it was just like, man, I don't want this for myself. I don't want this for my son. I want to be a woman inspired. I want to be loving my life or at least feeling like I'm working towards 
you know, something better than this existence, because this is awful. This is terrible. I don't want to feel this way. And so that's when I really started to make self-care, you know, as, as a catchphrase as that was, and I think it's kind of dying out now, but maybe not. Um, I wanted to make that the priority in my life because I knew that if I did that, I would not only be saving myself, but I would be setting my son up for success on how he was going to take care of himself and how he was going to treat potential partners in his life who, who yeah. valued themselves and respected themselves enough to do that. So cool. that's really... I mean, that was really my turning point. And then after that, I really never, never looked back, you know, whether it was journaling or meditation or going for that run, going for that workout, like that, those moments, you know, those half hour, hour that I took for myself were everything, were yeah. everything to my mental health and my self-esteem and, and where I really kind of geared the business towards, because it was really writing about those early days, turning those, those experiences into articles that gave me the momentum to say like, okay, well, maybe I could do this, you know, like maybe I could be motherhood unstressed and have this company and have this podcast and have, you know, a CBD line out there to help women fundamentally realize that they are worth the effort. They're worth, you know, feeling guilty for a second so that you can come back then into your house filled up and happy and, and fully alive when you're interacting with your partner, with your children, with your work. I mean, you fundamentally change who you are when you make the decision to take care of yourself. Yeah. You hit on something so big and it was, um, I mean, all of that was big, but when you're talking about <laughs> what, what am I modeling for my son in terms of what being a mother and wife and a woman looks like, and that is so big. I mean, I'm also divorced and that was a big thing. You know, you hear a lot with divorced people. It's like, oh, I can't do that to my kids. I can't, yeah, I gotta, we gotta stay together for the kids. And you know, my daughter just told me the other day, she's like, I hate when I hear people say that, like, I would never want to be in a home where both of my parents are miserable and they're doing that for me. Like, and especially, I think, especially with boys, um, this, what are we modeling? for them that mm -hmm. women are just there to do whatever they want all the time. And it, it pushes this message through the generations of yeah. this sadness, this overwhelm. And every single mom listening to this knows exactly what you're talking about on a deep, deep level of, I have completely lost myself. I don't even remember who I am anymore. I'm numb, just going through the motions every day. I have no yes. ambitions. I have no drive. I have no dreams. Like it doesn't even matter anymore. And you just slowly find yourself like dying inside. Yes. Not only that, but you're riddled with guilt all the time of I'm still not doing enough, no matter what. Like I just, you know, it's this, it's like our job to be these self-sacrificing <laughs> slaves to our families. And I think I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. And I know the courage that it takes to like, be like, I can have a podcast. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, weird moment, the weird moment with yourself. I'm like, do people want to listen to it? Okay. But when you're, when you're, um, when you aim to serve and you know, what's yeah. needed, it's like, it's, um, it's just, it's beautiful and it, it is needed. And I just have to say, I'm excited for the women listening. I hope that some of the things we talk about today bring some things to mind about how we balance this. Cause you, like you said, we all want to still be there for our kids and yeah, our families and yeah. like it's super important to us, but with this, uh, higher wisdom, I think of like, what am I teaching them though? What am I modeling for them? Like, let, I want to make sure that they are people that also honor themselves. I wouldn't want yeah. my kids to be trapped in some unhappy marriage or slaving over their kids all day, completely miserable either. So, um, let's get into a little bit of nitty gritty, if you don't mind. So, you know, you're talking about, about motherhood all the time. What are some of the things that you see keep women in a place that's like beneath them, like beneath mm -hmm. what their happiness levels are? What are some of the common, maybe emotions or beliefs about motherhood that keep people in a place that's not very happy? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great place to start because I feel like 
there's all these expectations that, you know, society puts on us, of course, but they're also ones that we put on ourselves based on how our mothers behaved, based on yeah. how their mothers behaved. And it truly is inherited down through our DNA that this is, this is what a good mother does. And this is yep. how she's supposed to behave. And she's got to have dinner on the table. And, and, and all of those are beautiful things. I think they come from the right place. Like, right. of course, we want to take care of our families, like you said. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it also limits us. You know, we don't see that there's other ways of being, of living. And so we don't even think that that's an option, you know, and right. we are, it's, it's almost like a piece of glass. And we think that, you know, these, these dreams and these things are on the other side of the glass and you can't go beyond it. But what happens <laughs> if you just extended your hand out and grabbed something, you know, what if, what if there was no glass, you know, and I think breaking past those barriers, those limitations that we put on ourselves just little step by step, little bit by little bit, you know, taking a 30 minute workout, you know, pushing, pushing in like a 10 minute meditation when normally you'd just be scrolling on your phone starts to expand what you can achieve in your life and what you can experience in your life because you're allowing it in. You're literally mm. creating space to have a different existence in life. And so I think so many women, what holds them back is that they don't think that that's even possible for them. They yeah. don't think that they have the time to even, you know, the luxury to even do that for themselves. But if you have five minutes to focus on your breathing, to really tune into who you are, to get to know her on a fundamental level, you will start to see that you have more time and you can make these incremental changes, which are so necessary for your happiness. Yeah. I, you know, you're reminding me when my first was born, when my daughter was born, I remember that I felt bad bringing her to the daycare at the gym. I felt like that I was me being selfish. I'm, you know, possibly exposing her to all these viruses and she might get sick because of it, just because I'm so selfish and need to go work out. Right. That was where I was at. And I remember telling my pediatrician that, and you know, he's just this guy, I mean, he's dad, but he just looks at me when I said something like that. And he goes, you deserve to be able to work out. She'll be fine. (laughs) <laughs> you, you go do that for yourself. And it was, I appreciated him giving me that, you know, permission that I apparently needed. And I look at how, where I've come now after going through a life changing transition of honoring myself. And now I go to the gym and of course my kids are older, so they they're self-sufficient, but I leave for the gym and I'm like, I want this kitchen clean when I get back. Yes, <laughs> so yes. like, what, a, what a change, you know, and look at that. Like, they, by honoring myself, I'm also better able to lead them. You know, it's not good. Our kids are so spoiled, like um, at least in the United States and a lot, most, uh, you know, somewhat financially thriving countries right now. Like they haven't, a lot of them haven't been through very much hard, right. Kind of sit in climate controlled rooms with Wi-Fi and eat plenty, all the food they could ever want. And that's Mm -hmm. it, you know? And so, when we, I've learned that when I prioritize myself, I have to, I need their help. They have to contribute to the family because I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and do everything. (laughs) And so it's, it it teaches our kids better leadership skills, better um, life skills, I guess, when we honor ourselves and allow them to help instead of our egos needing us to be the perfect mom by doing everything for everyone. And then we end up resenting everyone because we're burnout and all of those things. Exactly. That's exactly it right there. That burnout feeling, that feeling like no one's helping me, you know, this is futile. I'm just miserable, but Oh, I'm, I'm doing the same thing the exact next day. I mean, that is the definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And so, yeah, you, you, when you start to, like, I love that you said, you know, you tell your kids now to clean the kitchen. I just started doing that with my nine-year-old and I was like, Oh, I don't know. Can he, can he do this? Is it even possible? Again, going back to possibility. And of course he can, of course he can. And it has like, it has made him more responsible around the house. It is, Um, he stands up straighter because he, you know, is doing things and helping the family and it's not always roses, but Right. That little, like that little decision not only helps me out a great deal, but it helps him out. You know, it helps yeah. him be a leader in his own classroom and community. Totally. My, when you say classroom, my sister was an elementary school teacher for a long time and was like generally third and fourth grade. So about the age that your son is. And she, she didn't have kids at this time. And I remember her saying, she's like, I wish that the parents could see 
their kids when they're not there. They are so mm-hmm. capable. They remember all of their responsibilities. They put all the things away. They have so much capacity. And then as soon as their mom comes in the room for something, they turn into these helpless little babies. <laughs> and yeah. she's like, I'm just looking at it like, he can definitely do that, but the mom's like, Oh, I'll do it for you. You know? And it really stuck with me, um, in my home life. Cause I think, you know, it, there is a transition. Your kids are constantly changing and what they're capable of. And so it's easy to get stuck. I think in the, they can't do anything and I have to do everything mentality. And we have to be mindful and conscious of like letting them, like you're describing, like let them try, let them yeah. fail, let them do a crappy job washing the dishes <laughs> and, and let them keep learning and show them, Hey, you didn't rinse that. And all that stuff is stuck to the pan. So next time rinse that better, you know? Yeah. And I think a huge part of being aware and being present is, is to become really self-aware because like when we do the inner work, when we do take care of ourselves, we're better, we're better able to walk into a room and truly see these little people that we're raising and where they are right now today. Yeah. You know, if you, if you're looking at them, but your, your brain is, you know, overcome with memories of the past and how they were even a year ago, you're going to be at a disadvantage and they're going to be at a disadvantage because you're not holding them to the standard where, where they can actually meet it. And they can even probably surpass it. You yeah. know, you just look at schooling in Europe and beyond. I mean, they are way ahead. Look at Japan and, and their school system. Like, you know, light years ahead. Uh, you know, we're teaching these little kids things that they can absolutely handle we're yeah. just deciding that, you know, our kids aren't ready for that yet. It's so true. Even my nine-year-old yeah. is in a basketball team. It's his first year. And he said, I, I went into the practice and I was really surprised because the coach was teaching them. Like they had numbers. Like if you've ever played basketball on a team, there's like one through five and positions and plays. And they were running these plays. And I'm like, it's, just, he's nine. And it's the first time playing basketball. I was like, that is awesome that he yeah. is learning this already. And cause I was like in eighth grade when I first started learning that. And I said something to my son about it. And he was like, yeah, some older teenager kid came in and said, I didn't start learning that stuff till high school. And he goes, we can totally do it. That's what he said. Yes. (laughs) You know, so there the kids are more, I guess that's a good, you know, it's just something to keep in mind as moms. Like our kids are way more capable Mm -hmm. than we think they are. And they, I, at least for me, my kid, they will play me. um, They will play the helpless card as much as they can. Like, mom, Mm -hmm. would you make me a bowl of cereal? Um, no, (laughs) no, you can make yourself a sandwich. I like when you do it, you know, Mm -hmm. and of course sometimes I will, but they will ride that card as long as they can if we allow it. And it takes some, um, wisdom, I think to, to not need our own egos to be fluffed by feeling like the perfect mom that makes every single sandwich and wising up and saying like, no, it's important that you learn how to make a sandwich. So go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. You talked about guilt this is, you know, and I, I think men and women alike, like the mom guilt, the dad guilt, you know, it's intense. It's such a fascinating thing, right? This, Mm -hmm. this Uber responsibility that we feel. And I mean, I don't know a single parent who's immune to it. Maybe there's some rock stars out there that never feel parental guilt, but psychopaths. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it's just part of it, I think. And I was just curious your thoughts on that. Like if, you know, I, I hear a lot like working moms, they feel guilt for that or, um, even stay at home moms, they feel guilt for, you know, not having their act together better. And they should have this perfectly planned day with all these enriching activities. And they're just failing, 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 you know, do you have any insights to share on getting over this mom guilt? Yeah, that's a beautiful question because I think even just asking the question gets the listener to examine it in their own lives. Like, have I been feeling guilty? And then when it comes up again, recognize it. And then my advice is to choose to acknowledge the thought, don't attach to it, and then choose another thought saying, no, I know that my initial gut reaction is to feel guilty about, you know, going out the door and, and going to work out. But I'm going to choose to to remember this conversation and say, like, this is actually benefiting me and really benefiting my children when I go do this. So it's like, it's almost like you have to retrain your brain and retrain your your deep, deep grooves of thought patterns, you know, from society, from your mother, whatever, and and push through when it gets uncomfortable, you know, like anything else, like that's how you retrain your brain. You have to in your body and everything. You have to actively say, okay, this is what I'm feeling now. Take that bird's eye view that you, you know, have 
honed through meditation or some kind of restorative practice okay. and then decide, okay, I'm not going to latch onto this thought. I'm going to latch onto a thought that I want to have. And then I have the emotions that come from that thought. And I know that sounds very like esoteric and woo, but at the oh, same time, like Basically. it literally, yeah, 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 it works. It absolutely works. And it will carry you through, especially if this is something new that you're trying to take on, you know, you're trying to lessen the guilt that you're experiencing. Like it's going to be rocky, but that's, that's growth. You know, that's yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Dr. Amen, the, you know, brain, he's one of my favorites on the mind. And he's, he says, just cause you have a thought doesn't mean you it's, you need to believe it doesn't mean yeah. you need to stick with it. And so, yeah, it's like, what am I, what's going, being self-aware enough to examine, like, what is going on with that? Is that even true? Like, is that healthy to feel that way? Like, let me examine mm -hmm. something else. I, I had an experience with this last night is coming to my mind because I, I, I still, you know, I admit, I still have this, like I, when I have my kids, cause I only have them every other week and I work. Right. So it's basically just evenings. And so it's like, I just want to be with them as much as possible yeah. during that time. And last night, my nine-year-old forgot uh, his hoodie at basketball practice. And I'm like, I, I can feel it. I can feel this anxiety in me, like hurry and get home, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, I called my daughter and was like, Hey, we got to run back and get Micah's basketball, you know, his, his hoodie. And she's like, okay. <laughs> like, she, she's like, okay. Like, I don't know. And? <laughs> like she was like, okay, hurry. Cause we miss you and can't wait another 15 right. minutes. You know, that wasn't right. me. The kids are fine. They're like, I, yeah, I'm trying to watch something right now. And you interrupted me is probably what she was thinking. Right, you know? right. <laughs> but that's so, a classic um, example uh -huh. yeah, of what yeah. we put on ourselves and what we carry with us when it's really unnecessary. And I know that's easy yeah. to say, and the listener can be listening to this, like, oh, that's nice. You know? Yeah, sure. But to actually move beyond that obstacle is, is really where the real work begins. And I know like it is not easy. It's an ongoing journey. Yeah. I think, um, uh, another lesson I've learned with guilt is that when we have parental guilt, we almost transfer that onto our kids and like make them the victim. So like, if we feel yeah. like they are victimized, like it will come through when our energy and little things we say, and they're so young and impressionable that they, they'll they'll start to feel that way. Um, I learned that when I was still working through guilt about my divorce. Right. And I, you know, it was like, I felt so sorry for them. They were these mm -hmm. poor little victims that had to go through a divorce. And so we just like, if they left something at their dad's house, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, let's go get, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then, poor thing. It's good. It's going to be okay. Thing. And they're like, oh, little victim. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I am a little victim, you know, yeah, <laughs> like it transfers. Yeah. And so I, that it's really important. Obviously I'm still a work in progress, but like, it's really important to work through those guilt feelings. Cause as I shifted my own place within myself into, no, this was a healthy decision. Like this is, this is better. And that now that comes through. And, and so they say this similar things, like life is so much better now that you and dad are divorced. Like I have, my kids have said that, you know, and it's mm -hmm. interesting. Right. So I think that it's a worthy, very, very worthy journey in our own selves as parents to get past that guilt. So we don't in, in create this environment, in which our kids do feel like these victimized little, yeah. uh, you know, absolutely. You know, whether they're, you know, a girl or a boy, I mean, it's yeah. so instructive how we treat ourselves, how we move, like our energy, when we walk into a room, like all yeah. of that is like subconscious yeah. modeling that's going totally. on. So we have to, we have to be on top of that. Like we're on top of our nutrition, like we're on top oh. of our physical health. Like all of that matters with forming who they become and what they do yeah. in the world. Like it does. Yeah. Cause kids are like, they, they remind me of like horses or animals sometimes because they're so intuitive. Like they yeah. operate so much on energy. If I am the least little bit stressed, my 14 year old son will be like, mom, are you okay? You know, like he picks yeah. up on it. Alarm. I'm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I'm just tired, babe. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm just tired, but I'm, I'm good. I promise, you know, but yeah. it creates in them a feeling of a uh, lack of safety. I think like, they're like, mm, my caregiver something's wrong here. So yeah. Like yeah. being aware of our energy around our kids and how much that's impacting them. I think we probably have no idea I, unless we go to our own childhood and we can kind of remember. Yeah. What, what do like. you do? What do you do to kind of like get your, your energy, right? Like if you're, if you are feeling stressed, I'm always curious. Like uh, for me, <laughs> with, well, and specifically in regards with my kids, I get present with them. Mm -hmm. So I have found like kids, the best thing I can ever do with my kids is like park it on the couch and have nothing to do. 
like no phone, no nothing. Like I just sit there and they will gravitate. Like there's all of a sudden, all four of my kids will be in the room and we're just Mm -hmm. joking around and you know, there's no expectation. I'm not like, okay, kids, we're going to have a good talk right now. (laughs) It's just, I'm just available to them and they will fill in the gaps. They'll be like, mom, watch this, watch this, you know, and Mm -hmm. like appreciate just having me present. And I think it, that is a great way. It's like all of a sudden, whatever I might be stressed about or thinking about with work or my own personal life, like it's gone. Now I'm present with them. So I have found that just getting eye to eye, like making eye contact with them, with not even saying anything, just being there really helps kind of dissipate that space. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's kind of like what we do in the morning. Like they'll get up early, you know, I'll have like Arthur on or Curious George. And then sometimes I'll just go and sit on the couch with them and like get under the blanket, even if it's like yeah. five minutes. And like, if they were grumbling and just not wanting to go to school or whatever, like mm-hmm. their energy shifts, you know, yep. that changes and they're like happy. And then they're eating breakfast and then we're out the door. Like, yeah, just spending that real time with them, even yeah. though it's, it's quality over quantity, but it matters and it, yeah. it is effective. Yeah. It's like even nonverbal. It's like, you don't even have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Just be with them, be in it with them. And yeah, you're right. Even if it's just for a few minutes in between tasks, like it, it means a lot to them. It's easy to pick up on. I'm just so glad that we're aware of this, like now, you know, like while our kids are still like in the home and like anyone tuning into this, like, even I think if your kids are older, you can still experience this. You can still share these quiet moments where you're not talking. You're just physically being, you know, exchanging energy that way. Like it can still transform the relationship. I just love that we're having this conversation. Yeah, that's a great point. And that leads me to another, you know, I know many of my clients are uh, in that point of parenting where some of their kids have moved out or some are getting ready to move out or they're, you know, they're older. And I know one thing that really stresses those moms out is a feeling of loss of control at all over Mm -hmm. their life. They worry, they worry incessantly. There's a lot of worry. And I know you haven't gotten to that stage yet, but since you have your podcast, I'm curious if you have any insights for like being able to let go. It's, it's almost like a, a, a boundaries or, you know, I do a lot of the work of Byron Katie and she talks about, um, your, um, your bit, the three businesses, like my business, their business, God's mm. business, or, you know, um, I, I, that's, I know a struggle for a lot of moms and I can feel it in myself, my yeah. oldest is 16. And I'm like, I can literally feel anxiety when I think about her, like moving out. I'm like, Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> You're going to be good. Like, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. a uncomfortable feeling. Any insights that have come up in your work yeah. on getting into a healthy place with that? Yeah. That's like absolutely one of my favorite things about having a podcast is you get to yeah. pick the brain of so many different yeah. individuals and their expertise. And, um, what, you know, from psychologists to doctors, one thing that sticks out was I had a doctor on and he talked about taking a scaffolding approach to parenting. You know, like you see a scaffold outside of a building. It's just there to kind of support, you know, support yeah. as the building rises up and, and forms into what it's going to be. And that's exactly how we're supposed to approach parenting. We're always there. We're always there, you know, to catch them if they fall, but you're not so involved that you're going to be moving the building somewhere else. Like the building is the building. It's going to be who it's going to be. You're just there to support along the way. And I think that, you know, whether your child is in the home or they're off creating their own way in the world, you're always just in the place of that scaffold. And then eventually you can fully remove it and you can really just be more as, as friends, you know, way, way, probably when they're in their thirties, but like until that point, you really just, Hey, I'm here if you ever need me. Um, and you just have to trust that the work that you did in those early years is going to manifest into their success and their happiness. And again, like, I think that's such a perfect question because going back to how we model, you know, how we live our lives, if you are a, someone who takes care of yourself, who is responsible, who's disciplined, your children seeing that their whole entire lives, or even if it's something that you get into, you know, at a crucial point, they're going to embody that, you know, it doesn't just happen in isolation how you, how you behave, how you go through the world affects them and affects how they think the decisions that they make. And so, uh, you know, your daughter will, will emulate that, you know, in her own life because she has you. Yeah. It's funny you said that. Cause I, um, I just asked her if she has taken Myers-Briggs, um, last night and she's like, yeah, I have. And I was like, oh, what are you? And she's the same as mine. Right. So like, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um, but that actually, let's take that to an extreme though, because this is something I see too, um, very common in parenting is taking 
the impact that we have on our kids too far to the point that every single way that they are is because of us. So Mm. like it's Uber responsibility. You know, I see that happen too, is like, my kid is unhappy, all my fault. My kid is going through a hard time, depressed, all my fault. I failed. I, you know, it's this like knee jerk, like every single aspect of their personality and Mm -hmm. all on me. Do you have any insights to share on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I do a lot of like, I don't know, like meditation where I try to kind of like leave my body. And one time I did like a a float tank where you just go for like an hour and a half and you just kind of go out into the ether. And I had the intention of like, how can I really be like the best mom, the best parent? I, you know, I'm, I'm here an hour and a half. I'm taking time away from them. Like, ah, you know, biting the guilt. And, you know, the insight that I got when I was deeply into that meditation was that, you know, as parents, we truly are just guides for them. You know, we're not, we're not here to direct every single thing to affect every single thing. They are who they are when they come into, you know, their bodies. And so to be that guide, again, be, to be that scaffold and to not take on everything that they're going through, I think is, is crucial to our own sanity and to theirs. Because again, you don't want them to feel like they're victim to our influence and what we do for them, you know, you want them to feel like they are the masters of their own destiny and they have support on that, on that journey. I love that. I feel the same way. I've, I feel like as I've done more growth work, I've become, I see myself more as a mentor, um, Mm -hmm. who is honoring who they are as human beings. Like my, my nine-year-old actually did Myers-Briggs and he got a protagonist. We just did this last night and I'm reading this, this description. I'm like, you are an awesome person. And I just like, and I truly believe that about him. He's just like a little rock star. I'm like, he's just such a great person. And, and it's not because of me, you know, I, I, hopefully I've helped nurture a lot of that, but it's not like I was a good mom. So that's why you're a good person. No, like he inherently, like he's, I, I admire my kids in a lot of ways. They have many yeah. gifts and personality traits that I don't have that I'm like, wow, that's cool. You know, I learn from them too. Um, of course, every once in a while, I got to put on the mom hat and be like, no, you're mm-hmm. not getting a bridge piercing. Cause like, <laughs> trust me, like you're too young for that, you know, like <laughs> later, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I think honoring who they are and seeing ourselves more as like a guide and mentor and encourager. Mm-hmm. Um, is like a, a very healthy place to be. Yeah. And I just have to know on your float tank thing, which I have had some very spiritual experiences in float yeah. tank as well. And, you know, meditation and you're, you're, you're hinting at these things. And I just have to highlight like how important that is. I think specifically as a parent, but just as a human being, but because what you're, what I'm hearing you say is like, I'm getting those deeper truths that impact how I show up on the daily from that, from source, from that space, you know, and and instead of programming of how I should be and all these things that bring me misery. And I just have to highlight that, like how important that is, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you want to share any more on that, but I think the answers that we really need are going to come from that space, yeah. not from, you know, books and podcasts and things like this are helpful, but in our own particular situation, um, there's a quota like that. It's like intuitions are data processed so quickly, so many data points processed so quickly that it's difficult for our conscious mind to identify yeah. why we are feeling what we're feeling. There's just so much information. And when you go in that space, you, it's just, it's fast. You get access. Right. Yeah. The language, you know, words and and like, it doesn't even compare to the amount of data that's being processed from like our bodies are energetic bodies. Like we're, we're all connected too, which to me is like something that's just now truly being proven by science, which I think is just so amazing. And so to, to be able to tap into that and to be able to trust the inner knowing that we all have every single person tuning in has this inner knowing we all have this capability. It's about making the decision to turn that on. And then when it is on to be like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm going to trust this. And I'm going to act on, on what not, you know, what insights are coming up and then just watch, watch how your life transforms because it can go, it can go in a drastically different way, but it's always good. It's always towards your highest good and your purpose. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to your original message of, um, it's not selfish to take time for yourself because look what happens in your relationship and your family and yourself, the beauty that comes from like that space. Like you are not going to have that same level of tapped in intuitive knowledge 
when you're, you know, making dinner, you might get a little bit, you know, but when you're talking and being active all day, like you just can't hear it. It's quiet. It it requires some presence of mind. Um, I like how Napoleon Hill calls the mind a receiver. It's like, that's how I see it. in meditation is like, I'm just going in receiver mode. So I'm going to try to get all the busy work out as much as I can, uh, gently and kindly and just whatever you got for me, like I'm here for it, you know? And yeah. Yeah, that's and especially too, like as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, yeah. how many insights have you gotten when you have gotten quiet and you're like, oh, I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that until just now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, same, same, absolutely the same. It's creation. It's the it's the space of creation, um, in, in my opinion. And if you want to create a beautiful home life, you know, and you're just going through the motions and just layered with guilt and busyness and all of that, you miss you miss the opportunity to get the information where you're going to create beauty. So it's like, yeah, moms will ask me, they're like, dude, do you have, seriously, you get up and meditate and you have kids. Like, do your kids like interrupt you? I'm like, no, because I get up way before them. (laughs) But if they do, I just, I'll just open my eyes and kind of like beckon for them to come sit by me. And I I just go back with my eyes closed. And sometimes they do. And they last about, you know, 45 seconds max, but I'm like, you know what I mean? So I'm glad that I can model that for them, that they know that I get up early and, and, and tap in. I want, I hope they do that someday, you know? Um, Yeah. I make a point to leave my door open. This is my office slash where I do yoga and work out. And so like, I leave it open so that then when when they come home from school, like they know, like I'm up here, I'm working out, they'll watch me. It'll, you know, go into the subconscious. And then, you know, my son, my nine-year-old the other day, made up a whole workout that he like he like pasted to the wall and was like I'm gonna do this and it's like I came out of you know nowhere but it wouldn't have happened unless I was you know my butt wasn't in here doing my stuff yep yeah 100 I I uh you don't realize how much they're watching and learning and listening and I will talk about cold showers a lot that's been a big thing in my life and sure enough it was like months and months down the road I found out both of my oldest two kids had consistently been doing cold showers I never talked to them about it I just kind of heard that in passing you know and so yeah modeling uh I think when we are living in our highest vibrational frequency that we can what better gift to your kids than to model that for them and so it's not selfish at all it's like the best thing you could do quote unquote for your kids I think anytime we're doing what's best for us that's the best for everybody else around us too I just got chills absolutely I couldn't agree with you more yeah okay let's talk about CBD Uh, (laughs) why let's I mean obviously I think most people know what a baseline like CBD can help with muscle soreness, recovery, um, relaxing before bed, you know, just wondering if you had anything you wanted to share about CBD in terms of fighting stress or why moms might want to think about using it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, CBD has been out for a while now, so it doesn't have like the same shock factor that it did when it first came on the market. I mean, cannabis, there was an article just recently talking about how that, you know, helps prevent, um, COVID transmission. And Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Um, but I just thought that that was interesting because there's like every day, I feel like there's a new study about how beneficial CBD is for, yeah. you know, neuroplasticity and inflammation and just overall, like it, it does affect the whole body through the endocannabinoid process. And so for right. me, when I was really setting off, you know, all my journey of entrepreneurship, I knew I wanted to do the podcast full time. I knew I wanted to, you know, quit my full time job. I worked for the government. I was a paralegal. I wow. done it for 11 years. I know something totally different. Uh, um, and it was just like, okay, well, what, how am I going to actually make that happen? And so CBD came along and I was like, well, this is a perfect accompaniment right. to the brand, you know, to helping Definitely. others be less stressed. And in a way that's natural, you know, I didn't want something that was going to, um, I don't know. I, I just wanted something that I used personally and that I knew worked and that, you know, made me feel better. So I just kind of went with it and it's, it, it's been years now. 2018 was when I started the line. And so we're in stores and salons and what is it called? Oh, motherhood unstressed. It is called motherhood unstressed. Everything's under the same moniker for my sanity. (laughs) Yeah. And and if, in case anybody doesn't know, you know, when she says endocannabinoid system, endo means within, from within the body. So our body creates cannabinoids. We have receptors for them. It's as natural as it gets. You go for a walk and exercise, you're going to create cannabinoids. So it's, uh, you know, generally, how do you feel when you go for a walk or go Mm -hmm. exercise? You feel better. You know, I talked about that runner's high. It's not, it's not endorphins. It's actually cannabinoids. 
I've been reading some about that lately. It's, it's super fascinating. And yeah, anything that comes from a plant, like I'm all about it. Let's go. Like, all, you know? so, well, yeah. and women, especially all of your women listeners, like the uterus has so many cannabinoid receptors, like oh, your body, know. especially as women need lots of cannabinoids to function properly and to huh. be healthy. So there's another, there's another. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge fan. I use it before bed and it feels like bliss. I don't know how else to put it. It just feels like my whole yeah. body is just like buzzing in this heavenly bliss, you know? So it's a mm-hmm. nice way to end the day for me for sure. And I know so many athletes love it for recovery as well. So oh, it has absolutely. a lot yeah. of purposes. All right. Well, okay. So let's let people know where to find you. Obviously motherhood and stress is your podcast and I'm assuming it's on all the, it's, all, the yeah, platforms. It's all, all the platforms, Instagram, all of that. Um, God, thank you so much for having me on your show. I love what you're doing. I love the motivation that you put out. Um, I'm going to start working on my deltoids as soon as I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how instructional your video, your videos are like, it makes Thanks. it so easy to, uh, to, to feel like you can do it, you know, and not be intimidated by the gym. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And like that, I would say the exact same thing for what you're doing is like helping moms know, like you can be a mom and you can be happy. <laughs> like it doesn't have to, like your life isn't over and it turns into this. You just become this slave insignificant human that doesn't exist on the planet except for making food and cleaning. Like it doesn't have to be that way. You can also thrive and be a woman and be happy. And I'm grateful that you're just opening the space for that, for us to be able to talk about it. Because I know like when I was an early mom, so many of my friends were like, how come nobody told us how bad this sucks? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was kind of the, you know, when how we're invisible. Our how health. Invis- yeah. Yeah. We're I- like, you're not allowed to say that, but like, this sucks. This is so hard. Like I can't even see straight anymore. I'm just like living in a hamster wheel, doing the same thing every day. And I, you know, and so like, just like anything, when you're feeling that out of alignment, something's wrong, you know? And so it's usually programming. (laughs) So I'm grateful that you're creating like a safe space for women to be able to say like, (laughs) okay, how do I get out of this feeling? And how do I get back into myself and get into alignment? So thank you so much for what you're doing. And you guys, you can find her everywhere. Um, like you said, even the CBD line, but everything is motherhood on stress. So Liz, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Tara. This was a pleasure. Thank you for holding the space.